Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, a hearty welcome from my side. It's lovely to see so many old friends and uh, colleagues that have joined us for these proceedings. And uh, we look forward to the wisdom that will be shared this afternoon uh, in these rooms, or in this particular room. Um, of course, this is a very special day for us at IASA. This is uh, the 50th anniversary of the birth of IASA. And so we will be celebrating a little bit more casually later, but uh, for the moment, a little bit more formal. Now, amidst all these celebrations, um, it is also a time for us to reflect and a time of sadness, unfortunately. Uh, I think it's only appropriate that you would have seen on the internal communication channels that we've lost a couple of very dear friends very recently. Uh, people that have been associated with the ASA as collaborators and as employees and colleagues for many, many years. Um, we lost recently a colleague of ours from the Ukraine, Vadim Lialko, who was a very long collaborator of the Institute, had passed away. And then more recently, uh, Love Eckenberg, a well-known and much-loved IASA employee at IASA. And then, of course, the grandfather of IASA, uh, more recently, Yuri Ermolev, uh, passed away very, very recently. Um, I think it's only appropriate that we take a minute uh, of silence and just reflect upon their contributions that they've made to the institution and to remember them as friends, colleagues, and people that we will miss dearly. So if you will just if you bow your heads with me for a minute, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, I will not say much more. I'm just going to pass the floor at this stage straight over to our Deputy Director, Wolfgang Lutz, who will be uh, managing the proceedings this afternoon. So, Wolfgang, over to you. And uh, we will do some more formal introductions when we get to the other side. So, I'm not going to run through the room and take our time up at this point in time. But Wolfgang, over to you, and uh, we look forward to the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert, and uh, good afternoon. I'm glad to see the room so full with people. Um, as you may know, I've been for 25 years head of the World Population Program at IASA, and now uh, since uh, August, uh, acting uh, Deputy Director General for Science, and have the lovely task now to uh, chair this session in the afternoon. We have three uh, very distinguished speakers lined up. Uh, you saw the pictures. Well, first, it's Maria Uhle, then Eric Lambert. The two are also YASA uh, distinguished visitors. And then we have a special guest of honor, uh, Sergei Piroshkov, uh, Vice President of the National Academy of Sciences of the Ukraine, who will also share his thoughts with us. He was also in the 1980s and 90s uh, a frequent visitor to YASA. Uh, Maria Ule, unfortunately, is not uh, able to join us uh, in person. Uh, COVID is almost everywhere. So fortunately, uh, she now is here online. I hope the connection works well. I think she is known to most of you. She's the most influential science funding manager internationally, but especially for the US National Science Foundation. She has been instrumental in setting up the Belmont Forum, which is a key funding agency in global change research, and she is still uh, heavily involved in that. And currently, Maria serves as the program director for international activities in the Directorate for Geosciences at the National Science Foundation. We'll have all these uh, three uh, presentations, one after the other. The hope is it should be roughly 20 minutes. And then we have a joint question and answer session. So whenever you have questions, try to remember them. And uh, Maria, the floor is yours now. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies 
folks for not being able to join you in person, but as Albert said, it's probably better I keep my germs to myself at this point. So um, thank you for accommodating me. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get on with the, that should be it. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I wanted to, to talk to you guys today about um, some things that are what I would call dear, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think I'm talking to the, uh, the folks who know probably more, more so than I do about these kinds of things, but I think it's an interesting conversation to have from the perspective of uh, a funder of global environmental change and sustainability. So as we all know that um, the, just give me a second here, okay. So we all know that the, um, the challenges that we face really are um, much larger than any one field of science or one nation can actually handle. And we know that the causal factors of these challenges can subtly be interrelated and many often play a role in several different global issues. So the interconnected nature of these things means that the actions and the decisions designed to solve a single problem can invariably impact other seemingly unrelated challenges and lead to unintended consequences. So if we are to develop a just and sustainable earth that everybody really wants to live in, we really do need to be able to understand in a systems way, which is the, the sweet spot for IASA and many other organizations who have embraced the, the systems approach to be able to help develop sustainable solutions and to develop the knowledge from a socio-environmental standpoint that we need to be able to impart to create options and policies to help us reach that just and sustainable earth. So one challenge that we all know, um, this is sort of my, my go-to slide here on understanding how the world of research and innovation and decisions are typically separated. Um, we have research and innovation on the left hand side where we're trying to um, garner knowledge from the social sciences, from natural sciences, from engineering, from medicine, from all of the, the sciences and traditional knowledge. I think this is something that is becoming more and more prevalent, at least in the, the projects that the Belmont Forum is, is looking to do as to how do we bring in traditional or um, ways of know different ways of knowing to be part of that research and innovation landscape. And then on the other side of the diagram, we have the decision makers. So we have government, we have business, we have individuals. And really in a perfect world, what we would want is that there would be a clear and concise dialogue where science can help inform decisions and decisions can help and issues that decision makers need to address can help drive the research and innovation agenda. Um, and so we really do need to be able to um, kind of bridge that gap there across lots of different challenges. And there we go. So what, what we're looking to do here then is to create more of a, a holistic systems approach. So we want to be able to have the knowledge not only in the disciplinary silos be broken down into a more cohesive uh, unit around issues and problems, um, but also in marry the the issues that the decision makers are needing to to tackle. So we really do need to be able to what we 
called de um, Develop Ways for Co-Production to occur. There needs to be a two-way information flow and we really do need to understand the, the, the needs of the user community or the decision makers or ever you want to, to frame that. And that we both, on both sides of that fence then, need to be um, what I would call dual accountability. And so how do we, how do, we do that? Well, there's lots of different ways to kind of bring things together. And I think that over the past several years, we've been able to um, support and incentivize collaboration across disciplines through funding um, and develop strategic partnerships between not only academia and government, but also civil society and the private sector to help overcome some of these barriers and realize opportunities for the betterment of society. So really what we're trying to do is, in essence, provide evidence for decision making and having the feedback from the policy and practice group to go back in to help inform what challenges science needs to help uh, provide answers to. And so for the past oh, many years, 10, 15 years now, I've been working with primarily three organizations that have helped to set the stage to enable that kind of thinking and support for what I would call a culture shift in a lot of how we do do science. So I, cur I currently serve as the co-chair of the Belmont Forum and I'll get into sort of what we do in that in just a second. Um, in addition, I am the U.S. Representative and Chair of the Executive Council of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. And that is basically a intergovernmental organization that has come together to help catalyze partnerships and support for science to help understand the challenges that face Latin America, the Caribbean, and all of the Americas actually, um, and to impart ways to help evidence get to decision making within that thing. And then for the past 25 years, um, the IAI has supported about $45 million in funding, which I know doesn't sound like a huge amount, but um, they've been able to really help grow the science connections and the network within Latin America and the Caribbean um, and to bring and set up a more cohesive network where we are now seeing quite a few researchers and stakeholders and policies in the Latin America and the Caribbean actually being um, developed simultaneously and in cooperation. Um, so the Belmont Forum is a funding a, a group of funding agencies that have come together since about 2009. And actually, Albert, I believe, was one of the first uh, groups to join that um, through his position as the CEO of the uh, natural uh, the National Research Foundation in one in South Africa. Um, so th these organizations all seek to provide a sustainable and equitable world um, by providing funding for the state of the art and openly accessible and shared knowledge. So really what we're trying to do here is to facilitate and advance international research and scholarship to, and to remove critical barriers to not only um, science collaboration, but also to help lower barriers to provide solutions to mitigate and adapt to um, global environmental change and, and really to help promote resilience. And one of the things that we've been talking about quite a bit is um, our core values in each of these programs. And I'll get to the US Global Change Research Program in a second. Um, is that we are looking to help create that cohesive international global community that can come together 
and solve problems in an inclusive manner, increase the diversity of the community that is engaging, um, to be transparent, and really to have the impact of research help form policy and practice. And so we are trying to utilize a diversity of different knowledge streams. Um, so basic and solutions oriented research all have a place in, in this, uh, what do I want to call it, this, this realm. Um, we look at disciplinary and interdisciplinary research. And then we also focus on what we would call transdisciplinary approaches. And that's where we convene these different knowledge streams, including indigenous knowledge to co-design and co-produce the research questions with society and co-implement them um, to help solve some of the critical problems. So we've been talking a lot, <laughs> not only to each other as funding agencies, but also to the international research community around you know, what can we do together that we can't do on our own. And here are just some of the feedbacks in terms of the, the science priorities where systems analysis can come together and really create a big step forward in solving a lot of these particular problems. And we've heard quite a lot about integrating quantitative and qualitative approaches to help develop targets and pathways for sustainability. Um, to focus on the limits of the earth system. In other words, can we develop pathways and achieve those within a stable earth system? And a lot of you are working on exactly these particular um, questions at, as you're working at EASA. In addition, there's been a lot of discussion around assessing trade-offs and balances, you know, helping to produce options and pathways in this realistic earth system. And again, integrating state-of-the-art ecosystem models. We can't do these things if the climate models, the economic models, and the ecosystem models are not all trying to reconcile feedbacks and trade-offs between the different um, approaches and pathways. Um, and to really think about things like characterizing uncertainty and risk. And that has come a lot from the stakeholders. Um, and to address what we would call regional challenges. But we've noticed that there's some critical barriers to this, um, one of which that I, at least I feel like I can help with are the, the funding schemes and the, the fact that a lot of the research community has come back to us to say, you're asking a lot. You're asking me to be a scientist. You're asking me to be, um, a person who can co-design research questions with, uh, with society, and that's not something that I learned how to do in, in, in graduate school. Um, in addition, you know, there is a, a, a general call, call for the teams of research and the research enterprise itself to become more inclusive and diverse, um, and to really talk about how to decrease um, inequitable partnerships. How do we mobilize and support low to middle income country science because a lot of what's happening here is hitting those communities um, more profoundly than, than others. Um, in addition, how do we build that trust with the stakeholders, with the user community? And there, a lot of times we hear well, I would love to be able to do this, but I have to wait until I get tenure. I have to wait until my academic career is stable and then I can branch out and do this. And so a lot of the funders are thinking, well, how do we go about, about doing this? Well, we've come together through the Belmont Forum to, do exact, to address exactly those barriers. So we are guided by the Belmont Challenge, and that is to understand, mitigate, and adapt to global environmental change. And we're really here to accelerate the delivery of environmental research that is needed to remove these critical barriers to sustainability by doing what we do best, by aligning and mobilizing international research, uh, resources. 
And so our collaborative research actions are basically a calls for proposals or some sort of community driven activity that helps achieve our mission. Our theory of change is that we are here to support and I would say help establish a robust community that can engage in co-design and co-implementation of research questions with, with society. Um, again, we, we realize this is a big ask. So there are many steps that we've been taking to help the communities come together and work together better. So the collaborative research actions, we started in 2012. Um, so there's a 10 year list of the topics that we've been looking at. Um, we've mobilized about 420 million um, the equivalent of 420 million US dollars. We've supported about 160 projects, engaging 2,500 participants from 90 countries. Um, we are really hammering and supporting the transdisciplinary approaches um, for solutions development. And we are putting our money where our mouth is in the term, in, in the sense of supporting training and capacity building, understanding that not everybody is a data stewardship and to support networks where that needs to, to happen. So just quickly, the way that we put things together is, and many of the researchers here who have um, tried to do international collaboration know that it is a, a difficult process if you are funded through one organization, your partners are funded through another, and um, one of you gets funded and the other doesn't. So we're trying to lower that uh, barrier by having a single proposal that goes through a one peer review process. We are promoting what we call the multilateral. So we need three different countries from three different funding agencies. Um, each funding organization is outlining who's, re who's eligible to receive their funding and if there are any restrictions. And we are really hammering the and supporting the transdisciplinary approaches. For us, that means natural and social scientists and stakeholders that are co-producing and co-implementing the project. I said a little bit about an annex. So each of the different um, funding agencies is able to provide an outline of what their restrictions are so that this is known right from the beginning of the call and it helps the community put their teams together accordingly. Um, in addition, we found that this can be also a little bit, um, a little bit challenging. And so we've started to do uh, webinars and, and outreach in order to help uh, the communities navigate the, what would seem to be a fairly complex landscape. So we've, We've known that um, we have to, in order to really think about creating a, a just and um, equitable world, that we need to attract diverse partners and clients. So the funding schemes we need to do is to go beyond just our national uh, funding agencies like NSF or um, NRF or any of the other um, agencies that are participating. Philanthropy provides a really good partner within um, some, some restrictions. Um, the, the key here is that Belmont Forum looks to identify partners that can provide funding in places where the the Belmont members are having trouble. So we are looking to create what I would call a full spectrum from the basic research all the way to um, policy development. And each of us has a role to play in that. And we sort of stay in our swim lane, um, but we're able to pass that, that ball from one lane one to lane eight by working with other, option, uh, with other organizations that can help us do that. Um, and so we, we've looked at working with philanthropy, development aid agencies, the private sector to, to do and engage in this. Um, another, we're also looking to foster co-design 
So we're saying we, we realize that this is something we need to help um, do. So there are training events, there are ways for us to, to move all of this, this forward. Um, and in addition, we are looking to build the next generation, which is a, a, a key, key part. So we have several different programs. Um, the, there are partnerships between the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the Global Sustainability Scholars, Future Earth has the Earth Leadership Program. So what we're trying to do here is actually bring all of those types of uh, folks together to um, create a new and robust community that can help undertake these kinds of challenges. So I just wanted to show you a couple of quick um, ideas that are coming up so that you may you be interested in. try to come to a conclusion pretty soon? We... Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, so there are future opportunities coming up in climate, environment, and health. Um, and the Belmont Forum website is a great place to start. And you can sign up for those. In addition, we are going to have another call for um, transdisciplinary research for Pathways to Sustainability 2. Um, we began talking about that in March and we are expecting to launch something uh, next year. And I think I will just leave it at that. And hopefully, um... okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry for a little longer than I anticipated. Thank you, Maria, for this uh, very informative uh, survey. And of course, it's quite appropriate that we start with the funding. Uh, space because without the money on the table we can do very little research and it's very reassuring to see uh, that this sort of uh, holistic interdisciplinary uh, sustainable development oriented uh, research is increasingly also having its own funding mechanism. Now we are moving uh, on uh, our second uh, YASA Distinguished Visiting Fellow speaking today is Eric Lambin. Eric is uh, probably well known among you so I will not uh, say much, except he's uh, based at Louvain-Neuf in Belgium, as well as uh, Stanford University. He has extensively worked on land cover change and all kinds of environmental issues. He has a long history of collaboration with YASA, co-authored many of our reports. And maybe just since we are now having a Nobel Prize week, every day a new Nobel Prize is being announced. Today we've just heard that our uh, Austrian uh, former Academy President uh, Zeilinger gets the Physics Nobel Prize. There's no Nobel Prize in environmental change, but something that comes close to it is the Blue Planet Prize, and Eric got this in 2019. Thank you, congratulations. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thank you, Albert. It's always a great pleasure to be back at IASA. And actually, I was here less than a year ago to give a research talk, so this time I will do something different. I will share some reflections on the interface between science and policy. Um, you know, I, I love to read novels in my spare time, and uh, once I picked this sentence in, in a great novel by Jonathan Coe, the uh, British writer. You know, he writes that academics have that habit of focusing obsessively on one subject and letting of the, world, the rest of the world go unremarked and unnoticed. And that's probably not at all the typical yes -a scientist, of course, because you're bred to think about solutions and, and policy impact. But frankly, it does describe very well many of our colleagues in the leading universities of the world, because in order to have this depth that uh, that's required, often you need to have this very narrow approach to your topic. So this is creating this culture of, of insularity, you know, of isolation bet between you know, uh, uh, of academics with respect to the rest of the, of the world. And, and we're actually training our students to conform to some mode of working that are basically is really this excessive focus on that little discipline without thinking too much about what does it mean for the broader world. There's even a name for that. It's known as the Sagan effect, you know, from Carl Sagan, the famous US astronomer, who was an excellent communicator, but also an excellent scientist. And yet, he was denied tenure at Harvard University, 
And when his name was proposed for election at the US Academy of Science, his name was dismissed at the first round of vote. So there's this assumption that scientist research productivity is perceived, wrongly, as being inversely proportional to the amount of time they spend on outreach efforts, on popularity, on, 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 on science policy interface. But in fact, if you look at the data, if you look at these scientists that are really excellent communicators, in fact, you see that they have a very, very high academic performance, including based on the classical metrics of citation, et cetera. So this effect actually is, is, is false. So let's first look at this from a scientist's perspective. And there's this sentence, you know, that the academic is the one who'd rather be right than useful. And that's how we are trained, you know, that's what we're told to do always, just be right, be concrete, be, be, uh, have your evidence, and we'll see after, you know, if it has any usefulness, any impact. L let me illustrate that for, with one research, and I, let me pick one of my own research, because I would not like to be critical of a research of a colleague, you know, I would make some enemy here, so with me it's fine. <laughs> So, so let me show you one research that I've done with some colleagues that is really right. But then I will argue it's not that useful. I'm working on the policies to control tropical deforestation. There's a whole range of policies. And one of them, which is very widely adopted, is known as the payment for ecosystem services, where you pay land users to compensate them for the opportunity cost of not clearing their forest. Many countries adopt that policy, but we don't really know whether it's effective or not. So we say, well, we'll, we'll investigate that, but we'll do that with great rigor. So we designed a randomized controlled trial. We went to Uganda next to a major chimpanzee reserve that you see here in this dark red. We select all these villages around these, these parks in these areas, and randomly we assign them between control and treatment. Treatment, we go to the village and we offer each of the farmer a payment of $25 per year per hectare if they simply sign a contract where they commit not to cut any tree. If they would still cut trees, there's no penalties. So at the end of the period, we go back, we monitor, and if they've cut trees, we say, sorry, you don't get your money, but that's fine. And if they didn't cut trees, they get the payment every year. And then with the control villages, we do nothing. We just observe what's going on in these villages. And then we do all the remote sensing, very detailed, you know, the very high resolution. We count trees at baseline before the project, at end line after. We do a lot of field surveys. We ask a lot of questions to these farmers. And we find that uh, with a lot of econometrics, that in fact the uh, rate of tree cover decline was much lower for the treatment village, 4.2% rather than 9.1%, even though only a third of the farmers in the treatment villages accepted to sign the contract. There was no risk, but they said, who are these white people you know, asking us not to cut our trees? Maybe there's, there's some gold in our land, or maybe there's some oils, so I'm not signing. That's fine, so only one third, and yet we reduced deforestation by uh, more than half. Very successful, so we show it's effective. Great, great research, we publish in science, a lot of citations already, and we get these great press release, you know, The Guardian, New York Times, many, and, and what this press release says is that uh, we know how to reduce deforestation, it's easy, and it's cheap. And then me as an expert who has been working on deforestation for 30 years, I say, what? We know how to do it, it's cheap, it's easy, no way. It's extremely complicated, it's very expensive, and we don't know. So that's a case, very right research, but useless. Why is it useless? Well, if we continue your research, we start after evaluating one policy at a time, we started to evaluate what we call the policy mixes, the whole ecosystem of public, private policies, area-based, command and control, incentive-based policies. In these three countries, which all three of them at some stage of their recent history managed to really reduce deforestation quite dramatically, for Brazil that was short-lived, you know, as we know with the uh, Bolsonaro government, but they had something like 80 to 60 different policies directly aimed at controlling deforestation. And, and they were all complementary, they were synergistic. 
And actually, we even detect some very clear sequence in the way these policies were introduced. Always in all countries, you start with government-led policies of the type command and control, protected areas, you know, new regulations. Then you bring some incentives to increase compliance. Then uh, you bring some international funding in the form of Red Plus, the UN program reducing emissions from deforestation. And then some private actors, supply chain actors, make some zero deforestation commitments. You now these big palm oil, soy, cattle companies say we commit to source uh, or soy from properties with no deforestation. So it's really the whole ecosystem that makes it work. That's useful to understand how these policy mixes work. But just taking one of these 60 policies and evaluating it independently of all the rest actually was right, great paper, but not so useful. Let's look now from the other side of the equation, not from the scientist, scientist perspective, but from the policymaker perspective. Well, these people, they have to make daily decisions, really hard decisions. And they know they are dealing with a very complex world, multiple systems that interact. They know that all these challenges have cascading effect. It's really hard to make one decision in one sector without having some spillover, some effect, some consequence on the other sectors. And yet, they have to make the decision tomorrow. They cannot say, let's do the research, we'll come back in 10 years, we'll decide. They just have to decide. And they need simple answers and quite quickly. And they do it quite successfully. Let me also again illustrate that from some of my research on what we call the forest transition. So in Costa Rica here and also in Vietnam, we have shown that forest cover, which is here on the y, uh, uh, the, uh, y axis here, you know, from 0% of the country under forest to 100% under forest, over time has declined dramatically in Costa Rica and in Vietnam. But then at one point in the late 80s, you had a forest transition, a very sharp turnaround here where you move from net deforestation to net reforestation. And this is the result of these policy mixes I just mentioned before. And that was heavily promoted by some government policies with the goal of protecting their forest and even restoring their forest. But then when we start to study that more carefully, what was not understood at all at the time these policymakers were uh, making these decisions is all the spillover effects from forest conservation in their countries. As Vietnam had a complete ban on logging, was really protecting its forest, what happened if you were sitting at the border between Vietnam and Laos or Cambodia, you would see these trucks day and night coming, bringing timber from the neighboring countries into Vietnam, mostly illegal trade. Really hard to capture, really hard to anticipate. So basically what Vietnam was doing was just offshoring or outsourcing its deforestation to its neighbor. So a spillover effect that was completely not an intended consequence of, of their policy, but that's what happened. Uh, we, we try to quantify that you know, over time, so that's the volume of imported timber in response to these policies that was equivalent to about 40% of the total wood volume that was protected in Vietnam thanks to their policies. So basically, we have a glass that's 40% empty, 40% of forest conservation is just shifting it across the border, and 60% full, 60% was real forest conservation in, in the region. But again, a spillover effect that was not anticipated and could not have been anticipated really and it's very hard to control given the, that Vietnam does not have jurisdiction on what happens in Laos and, and, and Cambodia. In Costa Rica, same thing, but even more complex, even more difficult to anticipate. Costa Rica, very sound government, they uh, uh, tried to reduce extensive ranching that was the major culprit for deforestation in the 70s and 80s. And they uh, protect forests on these abandoned rangelands, but also invest massively in the very intensive fruit cultivation. Bananas, pineapple, palm oil, very high value, high yield, so you get a lot of income per hectare, therefore you can spare a lot of land for forest. Great, it works very well. A lot of forest recovery in Costa Rica. But then what happens? Bananas, pineapples, they're mostly exported. How do you export these fruits? Well, you have to transport them. And for, to transport them, you, you need wood pallets. 
a lot of wood pellets, huge volume of wood pellets. We quantify that. Where do you get your wood? Well, from the forest. Which forest? Well, the one that regrew on the land you spared with your intensification of agriculture. So you have this spillover between the agricultural sector to the forestry sector that basically undermines your forest policies through your solution. A spillover effect relates to the system uh, 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 of land use where all these sectors are, are really connected that are really difficult to, to, to anticipate, to understand, and even very difficult to correct once you've identified the issue. My third point concerns partnerships, because we talk about science policy interface. If we look at all the big, major international programs that were science-based and were quite successful in resolving some big international issues, nutrition, AIDS, malaria, etc., all of them are based on close partnerships between governments at multiple levels, the private sector, and civil society at large, including academia. It's really the partnerships that help to bring new research into innovations that are scaled at, uh, to a point that you can really transform the system in a significant way at the global scale. What's the role of science in this partnership? Really a key role. That's the only actor around the table here that is complete independence, not influenced by some special interest and, 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 and objectivity. It's, it's the actor that has the mission of informing decisions, not dictating, not mandating anything. And, and basically, as scientists, what we're doing, we just expand the scope of choices that are available to decision makers. We just identify the range of options and what are the pro and con and the consequence of these, of these options. And also, very important, in today's world, we inspire critical thinking among the public and political uh, 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 and, and, and policy makers. My last point here is that um, if science indeed wants to play this key role in the science policy dialogue, it needs to be fit for purpose. It needs to be able to understand, represent, model the key changes, past and future. You know summer is all the time where you catch up on all your readings that you could not do during the year. One of the best papers I've read over this summer is this one here, this review paper, that tries to understand why after three decades of, of, of climate policies, we've still not been able to bend the uh, 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 emission curve. One of the many points this paper makes is that uh, basically the way we approach our projection of future climate change is based on, on a rather linear understanding of, of societal, ch societal change. Uh, uh, our models are highly constrained by cost optimization, by the system inertia, they are really strict constraint, and, and there's a real difficulty in representing in, in, uh, in our models tipping points, biophysical tipping points, but also even more difficult social tipping points where there's a, a radical regime shift that really changed the system functioning. But we know by looking at history that actually the history evolved through tipping points, through these regime shifts. Why is it? Well, according to this paper again, is that a lot of these models put a great emphasis on the role of technology, on the role of market-based solutions, and we know that scaling up the technology takes time, you know, there's a lot of inertia in the system. So this is kind of slowing down the transition. While in fact, we know in the world that there are a lot of, uh, uh, um, qu quite a radical social political change that can create these transitions. So we need to think carefully on how to represent these tipping points, biophysical and social, in the way we project the future. Again, a last example from my research, coming back to these uh, uh, um, uh, two curves, talking about tipping points. Well, these are tipping points. You completely change the regime from deforestation to reforestation in a matter of a couple of years. No smooth transition there. It's quite a radical change. Um, I work with a PhD student, Marius von Essen. We are developing an agent-based, specially explicit agent-based simulation models of land use governance precisely to study these policy mixes that I mentioned in my first example. Precisely to study how multiple interventions interact, reinforce each other uh, in order to uh, uh, change uh, the uh, course of, of deforestation. 
uh, what we found actually, it, we had an extreme difficulty in representing with these models the kind of forest transition that took place in Costa Rica and Vietnam. You know, that's the best we could do here, you know, this kind of smooth curve, but we could not make that pre prediction through endogenous processes. It had to be prescribed exogenously. You know, we had to write in the code, well, 30 years after time zero, you know, the government will aim for a much larger target of forest conservation. We, we were exploring solutions on how to make that an endogenous process, and it, technically it's possible, but it would have required you know, an enormous amount of codes just to create this endogenous change, this radical change. So basically it was only possible exogenously, which I think is a limit in your ability to think about how governance can uh, uh, create these forest transition that are very real. This is reality, don't they happen in the, in the real world, but they are very difficult to uh, represent in the uh, uh, modeling world. To conclude, I just got the sign for the chair here. I think the first part of what I said is that we need to find the sweet spot here between being right, you know, being rigorous in terms of, of, of theory and method, but also being socially relevant. And in the second part, my second comment here, I think I added a third constraint here. We also need to bring into the way we think about the future slightly more creative imagination of, 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 of how the future could look like and, and what kind of future is desirable. And that's probably requiring a broadening of our perspective beyond the hard science, beyond, beyond the quantitative modeling. We need to bring the humanities. Maybe we need to bring the storytellers. You know, the, we need to read more novels and because they bring this ability to think more drastically about uh, 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 radical social change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. This was uh, most interesting, addressing directly this uh, issue of uh, what is the role of scientists, how we interact with decision-making processes, and in particular, not only to look at the natural science, environmental tipping points, but also the social tipping points. Since this is a topic that we're also addressing at YASA, so maybe during the discussion, you, we can have uh, some further elaborations with this. Well, uh, we are now moving to also science to policy uh, considerations, but in a very different context. It gives me great honor to have our special guest of honor today, uh, Sergei Piroshkov, uh, the vice president of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. He will tell you how he has been involved with YASA in the 1980s and 1990s as a demography, established a demographic institute there, but what I did not know until recently, uh, that he has sort of also a strong second career. He established within the uh, context of academia, uh, Institute of Russian-Ukrainian Relations. What could be more <laughs> pertinent today? And then also an Institute of Strategic Studies. Uh, so this institute was then transformed into the National Institute of International Security, clearly a, a most important uh, topic for the Ukraine uh, these days. So, uh, Sergei, can I ask you, you uh, Sergei will speak first, uh, uh, read some text in English, and then our Yasa colleague Olena will help to translate uh, some of his slides. Thank you. Good day, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Dear Director General, Dr. Juan Yarsov, dear colleagues, today, on the day of sighting by 12, 12, con 12 countries <coughs> of East and West, uh, the Yasa A Chata. I have the great honor to speak to you uh, on behalf of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine, uh, which has been the National Academy of Mambe organization of YASA since 1994. Dear Director General, Dr. Van Yarsfeld, on the 
occasion uh, of the remarkable 50th anniversary YASA. Let me present official greeting on behalf of the President Academy, uh, President of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine, Academician, Academician Anatoly Zakharotny, and uh, wish all research group new creative uh, victories. This anniversary convening demonstrated and feasibility on long-term international cooperation between states with different political system. For me, YASA is a particularly important because my scientific career was allegedly uh, by based it on the expe experience that it gained, gained while working on YASA as part of population program in the light 80s. Was special, special wounds I gratitude I would like to mention the help and support that Sergei Sherbov and Volkan Lutz uh, provided me during my short term scientific visits of YASA to YASA. Working in the population program allowed allowed me to master the basic of system analysis and computer modeling during the study on demographic problems uh, to reconstruct uh, the generation of the population on Ukraine with the destroyed in, in the Soviet Union during the artificial, artificial famine Holodomor, 1932-1933, Stalin's repressions and the light cities. In the 20th century, the period of the Second World War, World War. In the former Soviet Union, this research topic uh, with band and real demographic statistical data were uh, hidden, hidden in the Ochi archives of the KGB. Thank to modeling of real and real generations of the population during the demographic crisis of the 30s and 40s year of the last century in Ukraine century of Ukraine, in Ukraine. It was possible an estimate of the total population loss at 13.8 uh, foot. Oh, следующий слайд. Uh, it million popular. Uh, only on the 19th, 1903s, 
Ukraine lost 4.6 million of its, its, its citizens, including on 2.6 million people who died, who died, died, died due to super high mortality. It is also important to not tend the ever average average life expectancy was catastrophically catastrophically low up seven years for men and uh, up to eleven years for women during the Holodomor and 1932-1933. These figures were first calculated on the history of demo demographic statistics by Ukrainian and French demographers. <coughs> In the 1940s, uh, the total losses of the population of Ukraine as a result of super high mortality was 7.4 uh, million uh, guest deaths, deaths and seven years, uh, while love expectancy uh, read Reduce, reduced to 14 years for men and 20 years for women. This uh, result of the system, systems analysis of population losses during the demographic catastrophe in the 1340s uh, of the last, last century our the convincing evidence of the loyalty, loyalty of modern Ukraine to its, its international obligations confirmed is readiness resist of resist, uh, resist and manifestations to totalitarianism. Massive, massive and brutal violent, uh, violation of human rights, new manifestation of genocide. And 207, uh, the General Conference UNESCO, uh, unanimously adopted the resolution uh, by Ukraine, rem remembrance on victims of the great famine Holodomor in Ukraine. This was the first do document, documents of the Holodomor in Ukraine, adopted uh, within in the framework of international organization. Follow-up research conducted in YASA in the field of demography realized world population projection and new approaches and assistance population and assess, assessing population, population aging. Slide four. On 1996, Yasa book edited by Wolfgang Lutz, the future population of the world 
what can we assume today? Uh, and two hundred uh, ah, two thousand one yes uh, demographers were the first to period uh, uh, ethical and nature than the world population but uh, would would peak in the 21st century and then begin to decline. Topic, uh, this topic was as a development of the 2014 mono monography, world population and human capital on in the 20th centuries, <laughs> century. And 2019, Warren Sanders and Sergei Sherbov uh, in the monography uh, Prospective Longevity, a new vision in population aging. Preset, preset, propose, propose a completely new way to measure, measure, measure Asian. And 2020, mm -hmm. specialists of the Academy of Science uh, of Ukraine and just yes, published joint research. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like uh, to draw, uh, to draw your attention to the situation in Ukraine. I have prepared a number of slides and information regarding horrible, horrible uh, damage causes by the Russian and uh, full-scale military aggression. Alena Trasyuk can't be a great to convey this information to you. I would like to process World Alena. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. At that special day of 50th anniversary of IASA, I'm very proud to be of assistance to Professor Sergei Pereshkov, who has played a major role in the development and strengthening of the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian science. Today, Ukraine, unfortunately, is experiencing a large-scale Russian aggression. At first, there were implicit hybrid forms that began to appear 30 years ago after our state declared its independence. The military phase of this aggression began in February 2014 with the occupation of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and certain territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. This served as a basis for the authorities of the Russian Federation to recognize the territories of the Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic as independent political subjects. This meant the annexation of certain areas of Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine. Such act was a brutal denial of the fundamental norms of international law and a frank non-recognition of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. It de facto led to the destruction of the architecture of international security in Europe and the world as a whole that was established after the end of the Cold War. Therefore, it is not surprising that the next phase from February 24 of 2022, a full-scale military invasion of Ukraine started. Today, Ukraine defends its territorial integrity and civilizational statehood. In the course of this struggle, the Ukrainian people demonstrate amazing national unity and resilience. 
Dear colleagues, Russia's war against Ukraine fundamentally changed the lives of Ukrainian citizens. Peaceful Ukrainian cities and villages were subjected to barbaric massive air raids, shelling with rockets and artillery. Our scientific infrastructure was also severely damaged. It's okay. As a result of military operations, the buildings of many research institutions and infrastructure facilities in Kiev, Kharkiv, Sumy, Mykolaiv, and, and in many other regions were destroyed. Today's preliminary assessment of damage to the property of the Academy of Science caused by this aggression amounts to more than 340 million euro. Scientific institutions and infrastructure in Kharkiv suffered the greatest destructions. The whole world saw the burning buildings of the Kharkiv National University named after Karazin. The well-known National Scientific Center Kharkiv Physical and Technical Institute was shelled. The institute has a unique nuclear facility, Neutron Source. It has recently been built with the United States support. As of today, its parameters have no counterparts in the world, thus providing the reason for an international research center to be set up there. That is what it looked like before February 24th. And this is what it, it is left after its destruction. Fortunately, there has not been radiation leakage so far. However, more intense shelling may destroy the reactor and cause an accident comparable to the Chernobyl disaster. According to the statement of Ukraine's nuclear regulator, the attacks on this scientific center and the subcritical assembly neutron source can be qualified as nuclear terrorism. Moreover, the equipment of the laboratory of the Institute for the problems of nuclear power plant safety in Chernobyl has been destroyed. It provides scientific support and controls the shelter facility. The buildings of the institutes in Kiev and in Kharkiv have also been ruined. In addition, I want to say that my native town, Severodonetsk, was also bombed and totally destroyed and then occupied. And the university, which I visited for five years, was also completely destroyed in Severodonetsk. Our nature reserves and botanical gardens were also damaged. In these facilities, research in biology, ecology, and biodiversity preservation was carried out. Now, the demining of those territories is a critically important task, along with the reculturation of certain areas where active combat operations took place and fortifications were built. We are deeply grateful to the world scientific community for the support and solidarity, for the resolute condemnation of Russia's brutal aggression against our country. Our scientists, as well as millions of citizens of Ukraine, were forced to leave their homes and evacuate. At least 7% of the scientists of our academy temporarily moved to other countries. We are grateful to the neighboring states that provided them shelter, short-term grants, and facilitated their employment. 45 countries of the world have joined the movement to support Ukrainian scientists, students, and postgraduate students, both through general international job search tools, including the possibilities of special programs of the European Commission and through the initiatives of national research councils, societies and universities. The majority of Ukrainian scientists have not left Ukraine and continue their research and the scientific process even when facing periodic shelling by Russian troops and lack of conditions for normal life. A significant help to Ukrainian scientists who have not left the country would be introduction of targeted cooperation programs and grant programs in fields of mutual interest. Among such directions, we see research in mathematical and natural sciences, materials and engineering, social and human sciences. They also include information, bio and agrarian technologies. Preservation and restoration of the environment, studying the impact of climate change on various aspects of human activity. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will pass the world back to the Professor Sergei Pirushkov. Thank you. Oh.
Thank you, Alenda. I come back. I come back. Uh, systems, uh, the systems analysis is so great, important with the help which we must develop a modern model of restoration, uh, not only of sci science in Ukraine, but also of Ukraine society and country and the country uh, the whole, uh, as a whole. This is weight to real victory and development in the here future. Uh, and we solve this problem. No matter how, how difficult it is for us, but is uh, it, but it is obvious, 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 obvious this is the help of the international community could uh, by decisive, decisive for the restoration of scientists in Ukraine. Thank you. And Wish yes, a happy birthday. I, I sorry my English. I speak on the first time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Sergey, you want to sit here? Uh, Sergey, you want to sit here? And Eric also. I hope we still have uh, Maria online. Thank you. So uh, you really saw YASA yeah, work from the big global picture to some true realities. And uh, Sergei Piroshkov not only told us about uh, the current dramatic situation, uh, but also uh, this reference to the uh, terrible disaster that the Ukraine went through uh, in the 1930s, um, when, as you saw, I mean, I've never seen a life expectancy of seven years uh, in any calculation. And so it's not the first traumatic experience that this country goes through. So, uh, yes, uh, the floor will soon be open, but uh, maybe since the two of you spoke one after the other, I just wanted to ask Eric, uh, what, is your, what was your feeling and your reaction uh, when you heard, uh, uh, this, got this information about the destruction of scientific infrastructure and the, so many scientists leaving the country and uh, sort of uh, how does this affect uh, the long-term sustainable development prospects or are they completely independent issues? Thank you, and of course we all think about science as being a common good something we share, something that's beyond, that's neutral, that's, that's not affected by this conflict, but of course we see this systematic targeting of, of scientific infrastructure. But eventually this war will end and, and the cooperation will restart with Ukraine and but with Russia also. You know, there are many global issues for which we need uh, 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 all actors you know, to agree on a climate change treaty, on, on, on sharing data. So, so, so I think, as yes has been, since its foundation, uh, uh, science can be a vector for, for, for re-emerging dialogue uh, among scientists. So, uh, just, uh, if, you can just, if you can just give us, uh, in one or two sentences, your view, how do you think this uh, dramatic situation in the Ukraine uh, will impact uh, the global sustainable development uh, efforts. Yes, <coughs> yes, yes. Uh, I report on Ukrainian language. Mm -hmm. is help me <laughs> translate. <laughs> Я думаю, я думаю, що 
ці наслідки, які відбуваються сьогодні в Україні в зв'язку з воєнною агресією Російської Федерації, сьогодні ще повною мірою не з'ясовані. In my opinion, we cannot see in a full scale the, the truly consequences of this war, what happens now. Because Ukraine на фронті, на воєнних діях, по суті, перемагає. Але крім воєнних дій, перемагає за допомогою, до речі, світового співтовариства прогресивних країн, особливо країн Сполучених Штатів, європейських країн. Але у Путіна не тільки воєнна сила є, у нього є ядерна загроза, у нього є економічні важелі впливу через припинення поставок енергоресурсів, ну і так далі. Now nobody knows when the war finishes and nobody can predict the future behavior of Putin. And at the moment Ukrainian Ukraine wins on its front lines in, in uh, tactical fightings, but at the same time we need to accept that Putin has also not only um, fighting uh, prevalence, but also it uses economical leverages and also it has uh, nuclear uh, power, which uh, he uses as a uh, tool to influence. And also agricultural, agricultural means Security. of leverage. Mm -hmm. So uh, he influences directly uh, uh, agricultural security in Ukraine. Uh, Maria, I assume you can hear us. Uh, how do you view this from the other side of the Atlantic as uh, in what way the, the current war uh, poses a real threat to our agenda for sustainable development? So that, yeah, I, I agree with what's been said before. I think this is, um, it's tragic. It's having a, a critical impact on what we're trying to achieve. But I think this, this is the time when science diplomacy really needs to step up and, and become part of the solution. Um, institutes like IASA have been for forever trying to help reinvigorate the collaboration that we that we need um, to be able to do this. I, I do see this as a, a huge setback, um, especially for that particular region of the world, but also the other parts of the world that depend on not only the commodities, but also the, the knowledge and the wisdom that comes from uh, Ukraine and, and Russia as well. So this is something that you know, will we'll have a lasting impact. Okay, thank you. I think now we can open up. Uh, uh, we can go a little uh, beyond four o'clock, but not too much. So I see one hand here. Just try to be concise in your question and you may also either address one of our three panelists uh, or just all of them. Thank you. My name is Norbert Osinic. I have been responsible for IASA for many years in the Austrian Ministry of Science. Since the beginning, YASA has been very successful in global modeling within expected limits of growth in the spirit of the Club of Rome. But today we are confined, confronted with unlimited growth of international tensions and military expenditures. Therefore, I would like to ask Albert van Jaasfeld, could it be suitable for YASA to develop an extended global model for a world without wars? <laughs> Thank you for the very interesting comment. Um, I think sometimes in our models, um, 
We inherently accept that we're working in a world that's at peace. I don't think any of our models have actually incorporated the idea of a continuous conflict and, and disruptions to our global agenda in terms of achieving our sustainable development objectives. I think the opposite assumption is a real challenge to what we are trying to do at IASA. In other words, how can we progress in our sustainability objectives and agenda when it is clear that we may not be facing a world that is stable and can be disrupted in many senses. So that I think is a level of thinking that we have not really contemplated and not really injected into our thinking. We've made some progress by working in the areas of, of risk and resilience. In other words, what are the risks and compound risks that we have to uh, think about and contemplate but very few of these have been injected into our models systemically. Or much of this thinking has not been injected yet. So there's an area of work that I think IASA can certainly make progress in. Thank you. Are there other hands, uh, issues you want to raise at this uh, prominent uh, occasion of our 50th birthday? <laughs> Uh, it's uh, clearly uh, often the notion of uh, multiple crises or poly crisis is, has been used of, uh, for characterizing our uh, situation at the moment, uh, which actually in my view and probably of the view of many of the speakers and others around the audience also uh, makes it even the more important that we try to arrive at a holistic, at a, as a comprehensive as, as possible uh, picture and uh, this can be done uh, through all kinds of, of, of models and modeling, uh, stylized ones, very complex one, also some what is sometimes called sort of soft systems analysis in terms of developing narratives and exchanging uh, with stakeholders. So we really are using multiple approaches and multiple instruments and yeah, and just hope that the findings that we <laughs> produce will also be heard. We do this in multiple ways, uh, but I shouldn't be talking, it should be you <laughs> asking uh, questions. Uh, yes, please, Günther. <clears throat> My name is Günther Fischer. I have been working for a long time at YASA. Uh, when I started here, uh, mid-70s, uh, we had a situation with an energy crisis, a situation with a food crisis, and I think it was still Cold War period, or end Cold War, yeah, was Cold War period. Uh, and we have been trying hard to research food and agriculture, to re research energy systems, I think to research uh, international relations, many other things, uh, of course, environmental systems. Uh, and I think a lot of very useful and interesting and new results were produced by YASA. And I'm personally uh, almost desperate to see that after 50 years of hard work, I believe, we are in a situation with an energy crisis, with a food crisis, and I think an even bigger environmental crisis. So I ask my director, our distinguished guests, what can be done or what can YASA do better than it has done that these results are not only produced, but also get into use? I know. Uh, Perhaps we, you, you had some, uh, Eric Lambert had some very interesting ideas what is necessary for good research to get out and be effective. But I think we always forget in whatever change takes place, we have lots of losers, lots of gainers, and we have not found the best ways of sharing gains. Let's assume uh, we have win-win situations are usually the easy part, but whenever it comes to trade-offs, we are doing both internationally, I think, as also nationally, a poor job in sharing possible gains. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, you were directly addressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a tough one. But uh, um, I think what's key is that uh, we, we, as scientists, we go beyond this mentality, or we do the good science and these stupid people outside don't even listen to us and integrate us. You know, somehow we're guilty of not having packaged our results, communicated the results in a way that's really convincing, compelling, clear, 
for, for the public somehow to, to, to embrace that. Uh, as with respect to, to the trade-off or the win-wins, we can identify them. We, we can never impose them. We cannot say, well, this is the win-win. Just go for it. I think somehow, you know, we had this discussion just before, and I think you were saying that we need to pretend that this idea comes from the decision makers. You know, we just suggest the idea. Oh, it looks such a great idea, but it has to come from the, from, from the public. I think that's what Maria men mentioned also when she was talking about the co-production of knowledge. You just develop the science with the stakeholders rather than do the science and then present it to the stakeholders. I think that's a huge nuance, and it's more likely to be digested and integrated you know, if, if it's the former approach. But still, it's, I, I, I realize it's naive because there will still be the bad guys there that are really motivated by you know, territorial gains or, or, or their own profits. So we should not be too naive, but, but maybe a little bit just to maintain some hope in this world. Yes. I think it's an appropriate time to share some wisdom from Eric uh, based on our previous conversation. And I think uh, Maria touched on that extensively in her presentation as well. We as scientists sometimes feel that we're not being listened to and the society is not responding in the way that we've been telling them for many years what's coming in the climate space for argument's sake. Um, but I think Eric shared with us earlier that sometimes when we engage with stakeholders, decision makers, the public, and other people, the first step in being listened to is to listen. What do they want? What do they think? And how can we respond to that? So that comes directly from Eric. So I'll quote him directly in that regard. And maybe that's something for us to digest and think about. Thank you. Thank you. That's certainly uh, a, a right thing. The problem also, particularly in, in democratic societies, uh, is that these decision makers uh, cannot make autocratic decisions. It's not good enough to convince uh, the person in power because they are looking at the opinion polls. They have to win the next election. So our task really has to be to educate the population at large and inform them. And, and there, okay, often the, the lack of education in the population is an issue. The lack of abstract thinking, longer time horizon, and so on. And our climate model, other models tend to be rather complex and the, not easy to capture why uh, the person in the street now uh, should change his or her lifestyle due to some yet not seen uh, problems. And uh, I mean, there, and this is, uh, I think, something we at YASA as well have to go into deeper. And we have some initiatives starting trying to understand how are these uh, transformations uh, actually happening in societies. And uh, uh, we have many answers, science has many answers on the table. Uh, but we have to better understand uh, what are the obstacles for being uh, picked up and also shared in, in, in the broader segments of the population. So in a way, I just wanted to add this complication uh, that in a democratic society, and we see this all over, just looking to our dear neighbors in Hungary next door, or in Italy, uh, Brazil, what's going on, or even the US. I mean, there, there may be populist movements who just simply are not willing to accept this kind of sustainable development uh, paradigm. Time is running. Uh, we have going to be changed for chances for more informal exchanges later on. I would just propose that our panelists each say a few words uh, in conclusion, uh, some take-home messages if you want, and maybe we start with our overseas participant. Thank you very much, Maria. It's not going to be the last time uh, to talk because we have scheduled over the next days uh, some encounters with Yasa staff. Thank you for being ready for this. What would be your concluding statements? I think I, the, the main take home for me is uh, the last part of the conversation really has resonated quite strongly with me. It's, it's something that um, I believe science needs to think about what role it plays in society, how we actually, what the role of the scientist is moving forward. Um, and I, I really do think we need a paradigm shift. We need to be able to you know, reward academics for, as Eric pointed out, you know, the, the fact that you engage with the public doesn't mean you're not doing science. That's got to be flipped on its head. And I really think that we need to let the next generation utilize all the skills and talents that they have um, to, to move these ideas forward and to rethink what it does mean to be a scientist. Thank you, Eric. 
Well, I would just say there is hope. You know, radical change is possible. Radical change has happened in the past. And, and actually, the adaptive cycle, I think the theory that was designed here at Yaza by uh, Buzz Olling when he was director, shows that period of collapse are also a period of regen regeneration, of, of, of reorganization. I think we are in a zone of collapse and, and polycrisis, but, but something will, will rebirth out of these ashes, hopefully. Я хотів би сказати, що для мене Яса, ви чули в моєму виступі, мала велику роль в моїй, в моїй кар'єрі. І це відобразилось на моїй біографії, про яку згадував Вольган, що я створив три інститути і займаюся зараз, працюю в Академії наук. Uh, from, in my personal experience, EASA played a major role and it reflected in my professional career during which I established three scientific institutes and worked in, in the government. Але друга частина мого повідомлення стосується ситуації в Україні. Я хотів би, щоб ви познайомились з тим, що відбувається сьогодні в нашій в моїй країні. І це питання вже не тільки України, це питання світової наукової спільноти. Second part of my message I would dedicate to Ukraine because I want to engage you to the uh, to be aware, aware of what is going on in Ukraine. Сьогодні вже згадували, що після утворення ЯСи 50 років тому, на жаль, світ не удосконалюється і не стає всесвітнє благо для кожної країни, а кризи посилюються і ще виходять, на жаль, на воєнні конфлікти. Тому я вважаю, що для Яси є багато роботи на майбутнє, на перспективу. Тому я запрошую всіх до співпраці. Uh, I want uh, to invite everyone to the cooperation because it is a very huge need of scientific work and analysis in the conditions of these uh, challenges what we face now uh, in 50 years after establishment of EASA. We see that these problems did not disappear and we need to solve them and uh, uh, we need to put our efforts on it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, my last thought is that uh, let's meet again in 50 years and look what the world looks like then. <laughs>